Good evening, everyone. Hi. Hi. I'm going to go ahead and read who is Set Free. Set Free is a healing and recovery ministry that exists to provide a space for individuals who are overwhelmed by any form of mental health challenge and or addiction in order to grow, in order to experience freedom in Christ and discover a new way of life. This is a safe place for you to grow in your faith and connect with others. We believe that healing and recovery both take place through your relationship with God and connecting with others in the context of shared experiences. Our promise to every person who seeks help here at Set Free is that he or she will receive hope, encouragement, love, and prayer. Personal growth, however, is a process and not a destination and will always be based upon one's willingness to do all that is suggested. We encourage sponsorship and the working of the 12 steps. If you would like more information regarding how to obtain a sponsor and work the 12 steps, please ask your group leader or Pastor Jennifer Felix. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Robert. Talk about what's anxiety, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Robert. Hi, Robert. Welcome, guys. What is anxiety? Anxiety is your body's natural response to stress. It's a feeling of fear and apprehension about what's to come, such as the first day of school, going to a new job or job interview, or giving a speech. Things such as these may cause most people to feel fearful and nervous. But if your feelings of anxiety are heightened and are intensified in your life in any way, Set Free is definitely a place for you. We are here for you, and we're here to provide you hope, encouragement, love, and prayer as well. You are not separate from, but part of the ministry, family, and we welcome you. All right, now we're gonna pray. Dear Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for all these people. Thank you for giving us a place to, to come and worship you and have you come upon us and help us with our healing. And uh, thank you for the food that was provided tonight. And uh, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. And now, Jennifer Felix. Yeah. All right, how's everyone doing this evening? Woo! Right? Man. You know, it just, I think that, come on, we can do so much better than that. How's everybody doing this evening? <laughs> right? All right, so check it out. How do you guys like being back here in what's called the backyard space? It's kind of a nice area. Nice space? Or some people are kind of like, eh. Uh, it is. Well, actually, if we park up top, it's pretty close, you know? But it is, it is actually kind of nice, but... Once again, to remind everybody, this is the area we will be in next week as well. If you liked the food that was provided for this evening, we will actually provide food as well next week. And food will be uh, open and available at 6.30 p.m. as well for next week. And then, of course, the week after, we will go back over into the worship lobby where we have a worship night scheduled for you all. Okay? Yay, worship night. With that, though... We're continuing in on in our series, A New Perspective Can Change Everything. Who here over the last like month, maybe last week, maybe kind of even like last six months has gained any kind of a new perspective with inside of their life, right? Just a new way of looking at things, you know? Isn't it amazing how the Lord will work with inside of our life, the seasons that we're in, and give us that new perspective? But anyways, as with every week, I'm going to say welcome to anyone who's watching with us online whether it is a Thursday night and you're watching or you're watching on demand any other time throughout the week, I want to say welcome to you as well. If it is a Thursday night, please uh, don't forget we have small group time that gathers immediately following the message. The link to join on Zoom will be at scrolling on the bottom of the screen towards the end of the message. But recovery and healing take place in community and not alone. We, doing life together is better than doing life apart from one another. So I'd encourage you to join in. But for tonight, we're diving into this thing called revenge. <laughs> right? Now, revenge is an interesting word. It's actually, to me, it's like a powerful word, right? I mean, we've gone through anger and we've gone through like divorce and we've gone through the vows and we've gone through a whole lot of things with, with the Sermon on the Mount. But this next one is revenge. And to me, it's just, it's so powerful. And I believe that, that this word... It's so powerful because none of us would really want to admit that revenge is something at times within our lives that we've desired upon someone else, right? I mean, it involves emotions. It doesn't, it's not just about that executive kind of thinking 
that leads us into like, this is right, this is wrong. This is that powerful emotion that says, I desire to get back at you, right? And I desire to get even. Now, the reality is, is there's different definitions for this word called revenge. Like I just said, is getting even is one of them. But another definition is one that is retaliation for injury, loss, or humiliation. So who here has ever felt or had injury, loss, or humiliation happen with inside of your life? I think we've all experienced that, right? And as a result of that, it's like we want to get even. We want retaliation. And how about this? An attempt to transform shame into pride. Like somehow our pride has been hurt, right? And now we're like the shame we're experiencing, we want to transform it back into pride. And the last one is seeking uh, symmetrical injury, harm, or loss. See, but for us, the idea of it is we want something that has been wronged to us to be made right, right? And typically when something has been wronged to us, that involves another person, all right? And when we think about that reality, there's so many different, all, there we go. So many of us have fallen into that category Right? Where someone hurt us physically, mentally, or emotionally, or humiliated us, and damaged our ego and or our pride. And I guarantee you that none of us, up to this point in our lives, have gotten through this life unscathed by that. Who here has ever... Uh, <laughs> we're going to hope that this thing... All right. Who here has been injured physically, had physical harm brought upon you? Right? Who here has experienced like mental anguish or emotional hurt? Or how about just all of it? We've all just experienced all of it, right? And as a result, humil uh, humiliation has come and our, and our ego and our pride has been damaged. I know that this has happened to me. I know that, you know, oftentimes it can come in the form of uh, sexual abuse, you know? And I'm not gonna ask anybody to raise their hands if that's what you've experienced. Oftentimes it can come in the forms of abuse physically that's, that's non-sexual, but maybe that comes from a, a care provider, somebody that you trust, somebody that is supposed to, they say that they love you and they want their, your well-being, but at the same time, they're hurting you in detrimental ways, right? And I know for me, like I'm in this class for interpersonal uh, relationships that has to do with family violence. And do you know oftentimes when we are hurt by somebody else, it's by someone that we know. And oftentimes it's a friend, it's a family member, and it's somebody close. And, you know, and then we're at odds and we're at conflict because we want to love them, but at the same time we want to get back at them and we don't know how to get away from them. And all these things go on inside of our minds, inside of our very being, right? But I guarantee you at some point in time, at some point in time, many of us wish just a little bit that the person who has enacted that pain upon us might get a piece of their own medicine. <laughs> wouldn't you just like, to, and, and sometimes wouldn't you like to be the one to give it to them? Right? We, you'd like to be the one to give it to them. Where you just felt, man, wouldn't it be nice for them to get what it is they deserve? Right? And then, and then we get to decide what that looks like. You know, but what would happen if you and I got what we deserved because of the hurts that we caused others? Uh-oh. You know? See, because as much as we've been hurt, we also have to take a look at the hard, cold reality. How many of us have been the ones to actually hurt someone else? Right? I've, in various ways, I've, I've, hurt, I've hurt other people. And if I got what it is that, that I deserved, I wouldn't be standing here. Right? Because I know for me, I've been gifted a life that is far beyond what I deserve. How many of you believe that you've been gifted a life that is far beyond what you deserve? right? And all of a sudden, it puts things into perspective. Now, this, we're not talking about justice. We're talking about, we're looking at, at another person the way God looks at them, and we're looking at ourselves the way God looks at us and putting everything back in perspective of where justice belongs, right? And, uh, and at the end of the day, when it comes to you and me, somehow, some way, all of us have to somehow kind of mesh together and do our best to get along. But how do we get along? How do we do that when hurts happen, right? How do we do it? What do we do when those hurts when it leads people down the wrong path, making the wrong decisions? I mean, I know that many of us, we landed here at Step Free not because life was perfect and wonderful and full of roses, 
right? We're here because things were jacked up. Things were jacked up. For some of you, maybe you landed in jails or institutions, right? And you're like, man, I don't want to go back there again, so I'll do what's ever necessary to stay out of there. Some of you came because relationships were broken, right? And now all of a sudden you're like, man, I want these relationships mended. And maybe it's with parents, maybe it's with spouses, and maybe it's with kids. But you want it mended, and you're saying, man, I'll do whatever's necessary for these things to be mended. How about I just want to be a better person, and I don't know how to do that on my own. But there's, there's a ministry filled with people who have better ways and better ideas than I got. And I'm willing to follow their direction so that I can have that better life. See, and that better life is that godly life, that life that God desires for us, right? And, and it's hard to do that on our own. Have you ever tried to kind of lead yourself out of a pickle? <laughs> you know, usually it doesn't go so well. Right? And if I'm not self-leading myself, I surely can't be leading others. Right? Which means, man, we come in here to set free, and the goal is, is for us to help one another and for us to do it together. Right? But do you know in Jesus' day, they had the same kind of hurts. They had things happening to them. Man, they had adultery happening. They had murder happening. They had all kinds of things happening. And Jesus needed to address it. So when we look at this scripture and we're like, man, what's, just, what's Jesus saying to us? Well, first, what we have to look at is what's he saying to the people at the time. And it was important at the time that Jesus addressed the issue of revenge. Now, when you look at this, it's found in Matthew 5, 38 through 41. And again, we're going to see where Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say. <laughs> and I love that phrase because it's saying, I don't care what you think you know. I'm going to tell you something different, and what matters is what I tell you, right? He's like, no. Like, what you think you know based upon what you're doing, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. I'm going to tell you something different, right? And this is the words of Jesus. He says, you have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right chick, cheek, Offer the other cheek also. If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. You know, I get it. When we read that, we're like, man, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> uh, what happens if it's just instant reflex? That if you slap me, I slap you. <laughs> like, that's just kind of like, that's instant, right? Like, I mean, who here's like, if you're going to punch me in the face, I'm not going to think, like, I don't know. Like, I'm a pastor, but I'm, my, my instant reflexes might just punch you. <laughs> like, right? Like, and all of a sudden, if, if, you know, if you take my coat, I'm not sure I'm going to want to give you another coat. <laughs> You know, like, what does this even mean when you look at this from a literal standpoint? Now, remember when Jesus talked about if, you're, you know, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut off the left one, you know, cut it off, right? And you don't look at this from a literal standpoint. It's saying, man, you do whatever it is you have to do in order to avoid that specific sin. That's, that's how serious of a sin it was. So he was trying to make a point. So Jesus here is actually trying to make a point, okay? So what's he saying? I mean, because the reality of it is if we truly lived in a time where the punishment matched the injury and it truly was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a, a tooth, do you imagine that whatever it is that you do to me and I have the freedom and the right to do to you and vice versa, can you imagine the society that we'd be living in if, if that happened? That, that would be like a free-for-all, right? So we couldn't have that. We couldn't have a society with a free-for-all, you know, but, we, uh, but you couldn't have it you couldn't have the extreme of what they were doing. So what was really happening in this time and why? Well, all throughout time, there's this something deep within the human psyche that demands justice be served. See, there's something deep within us that demands justice be served when wrongs are committed, when we have been hurt, insulted, violated, mocked, injured, falsely accused, persecuted. People then, and you and me, even now, we'll typically turn inward and focus on the impact suffered upon us, first and foremost. Look what you have done to me. Right? That's, what we've, that's the first thing we're going to do, is look what you have done to me, how I feel, and how everything of what happened becomes about me. And it's not to negate, you know, the sin that that person has committed by hurting you, 
But when all that gets turned upon ourselves, we then want to project it out in a revengeful kind of a way, right? And abuse can take on, like I said, so many different forms. And because we live in a fallen world where evil and injustice take place, we're left with a simple choice given the circumstance when something happens to us. Number one, we can retaliate, which is to tend take revenge. Or number two, we can forgive. <laughs> and you're like, well, I don't know if I want to forgive. <laughs> can I just re forgive and not retaliate? And then I won't be bummed if something kind of happens to them, like a flat tire <laughs> or, a, you know, like if they lost their job, I wouldn't be disappointed. If, you know, whatever it may be that goes on in your mind, you know. Have you ever tried to pray for somebody that you're angry at? It's not easy, is it? That kind of a decision is difficult to make when the hurt cuts really deep. And it's an even tougher decision to wrestle with, you know, based on Matthew 18, 21. And this is what it says there when one is seeking forgiveness. It says, then Peter came up to him and asked, and that's him as Jesus, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? See, he was trying to get off really easy where Jesus might only tell him, yeah, once or twice is cool. After that, you can, you can be angry, right? And, G, and, and, and Peter says seven times. It's kind of like his if to give that number. And Jesus' response says, no, not seven times. Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. He's saying endless time and time and time again. See, and Jesus is addressing a mindset and challenging a mindset as it pertains to revenge, retaliation, and ultimately what he desires them to have inside of themselves, which is forgiveness, right? But why did, why did they have that mindset to start with, you know, that, that they could do whatever it is they wanted to do in acting revenge upon other people and that forgiveness had limits, right? Why did they have that mindset? Well, the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth is originally found in Leviticus 24, 17 through, uh, through 21. It is one of the laws that was instructed by God for the judges of Israel to use as a method of administering fair and equitable criminal justice. There was a reason. There was a purpose for it. However, the religious leaders of Jesus' day twisted the purpose of it and used it as a weapon to enable a man to execute personal revenge. See, that was supposed to be to enact criminal justice in the justice system. Could you imagine if we all took the law into our own hands? That'd be called, in our day, that'd be called a vigilante. Now, does the law look highly upon vigilantes? No. They say, let the law handle it. Is the law perfect? No. But the law handling it is better than a vigilante handling it. And Jesus is saying, man isn't to do this. And again, once again, why? Because remember, all of mankind was created in the image of God, right? All of mankind. And if I am going to become the judge, jury, and executioner of your sin, then I better be prepared for you to be the judge, jury, and executioner of mine. And that leaves us right back in a, in a society where now all of a sudden we get to do whatever it is that we see fit in the way that we see fit and not only that, it takes it a step further. See, it actually removes God from his seat. Because God is the one who is the ultimate judge. Right. And now all of a sudden, we've taken his position. As if we have a right to take his position. Right? And so here Jesus is having to address this issue with them. You know, and he's having to flip things upside down in order to make them right side up. Which, again, is why we hear the phrase, like I said, you have heard it said, but I say. And he addresses, you have heard the law says. So he's, he's not negating the fact that there's the law. In Scripture, it says that he didn't come to, to do away with the law, but he came to fulfill the law. He's saying, but the way that you are applying the law in your society, in your culture today, towards one another, goes against the very law that it is that you're saying that you are living by. Right? And, uh, and oftentimes, you know, we as human beings will do that. And we'll try to justify our behavior in all kinds of different ways. So what Jesus does is he takes the focus off of the revenge and he places it back where it needs to be, which is on the forgiveness. And in Romans 12, 17 through 19, the Apostle Paul says, Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. 
Do all that you can to live at peace with everyone. Last time I checked, never means never. <laughs> but I'm, I'm a human being too, so I'm not up here telling you that I'm like, well, did he really mean never? <laughs> like, let's really think about that. He meant never then. We're living in a different time now. No, 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 no. Scripture is just as applicable today in the way it is then now. <laughs> Meaning never pay back evil with more evil. Why? Because sin doesn't beget. Sin is, is not to be repaid with more sin. Right? Jesus desires for us to be at peace with everyone. And sometimes it's going to be hard and other times it's definitely not going to be easy. Because we're going to want that instant reflex to enact justice ourselves upon the person who hurt us. Right? But in the end, there is a cost to pay if we don't seek to live at peace with people. Have you ever just found yourself preoccupied with something that it has actually taken control over your mind and your very being? Where you can't sleep, you can't eat, you can't even barely function. And how often times did this involve the relationship with another person? And, and I'm not, this could be, an, you know, a boyfriend, girlfriend, a spouse, children. It could be just friends or coworkers. I can lose sleep over an argument I had with a coworker, Right? but I'm to do all that I can to live at peace with everyone and never pay back evil with more evil, right? And for those of you who have read the novel Moby Dick, we're gonna take it back a minute, nice. right? Moby Dick, in that book, in that novel, you have Captain Ahab who is obsessed with seeking revenge on the white whale, right? The white whale, who's who? Moby Dick. His long struggle ultimately re results in the death and destruction of the entire crew except for Ishmael, the storyteller. Nobody wins. No, nobody wins in a scenario like this. See, and the idea of this is that the pursuit of revenge has the capacity to wreak havoc in your life and, with the, and within the lives of those around you. And it's not the life that Jesus desires for you, right? And you know what else has the capacity to wreak havoc in one's life and those around them? You know, each week we've been talking about a mental health challenge that people may experience in their lives that we might think we have an understanding of or a grip of, you know, and, um, and draw conclusions with that we don't have any idea about, right? Now, we might have this much, and our little this much we think is this much. And then all of a sudden, we take the this much and apply it to everybody, and we couldn't be so far from, from the truth. And so tonight, what we're going to talk about, what I'm going to present to you, is a mental health of bipolar disorder. Now, this is what I find very fascinating, and is one I had limited knowledge about myself. But to give you just a little bit of information about it, I'm going to read to you the definition of it according to the American Psychiatric Association. Okay? Bipolar disorder is a brain disorder that causes changes in a person's mood, energy, and ability to function. People with bipolar disorder experience intense emotional states that typically occur during distinct periods of days to weeks called mood episodes. These mood episodes are characterized as manic or hypomanic, abnormally happy or irritable mood, or depressive, sad mood. People with bipolar disorder generally have periods of neutral mood as well. When treated, people with bipolar disorder can lead full and productive lives. Now that gives us a great overarching definition of what it is, right? But aside from the definition, there's one thing to keep in mind with bipolar is that the reality of it is, is there's three categories to it. It's not just one. So when somebody has bipolar disorder, it's kind of like, you know, in the realm of disabilities, there's say a spectrum, right? So autism, there's a spectrum. Well, with bipolar, there's three different categories that fall within the category of bipolar disorder, right? So you have bipolar one, bipolar two, and this bipolar three, which actually is technically called cyclothemic disorder, which some refer to as bipolar three or a more chronic form of bipolar. Now, when you think about these three types, bipolar one is the one that people are diagnosed with when they have, during manic episodes, they experience an extreme energy uh, increase in energy and may feel on top of the world or uncomfortably irritable in mood. Some people with bipolar one disorder also experience depressive or hypomanic episodes. And most with bipolar one disorder 
also have periods of neutral moods. Now, bipolar two is a little different, right? In this one, it requires someone to have at least one major depressive episode and at least one hypomanic episode. And then people return to their usual functioning between episodes. And by, uh, people with bipolar II uh, disorder often first seek treatment as a result of their first depressive episode since hypomanic episodes often feel pleasurable and can even increase. Now, think of it like this. Bipolar one, the extremes are like this, okay? Bipolar two, the extremes are like this, all right? So you have like a less extreme for the bipolar two, and it doesn't minimize, it's just not as extreme as the one. Then you go, right? And then uh, you go to the cyclothemic disorder, which is considered a milder form of bipolar disorder. And what that does is it involves mood swings with hypomania and depressive symptoms that occur frequently. And, and it cycles through, meaning it's constant. Now, for bipolar one, this and this, they will have longer periods of time, as long as they're seeking treatment, where they have normal episodes, okay? And then they're able to function really well. But then you get the, the cyclothemic, all of a sudden, they're not this and they're not this. They might be this, but it's constantly like this, <laughs> like more frequently. <laughs> so it, that's why it's called cyclothemic because it cycles frequently between their ups and downs, which means they actually have less of a normal mood state than the bipolar one and bipolar two because it's constantly cycling, right? Now, other facts about this is that approximately 60% of people with bipolar have had some history of substance abuse, which means we don't know who in here might have, you know, and again, any, you know, if somebody does not want to share that information that that's the, uh, diagnosis they have, then that's completely fine. But people with bipolar one disorder frequently have other mental disorders, such as anxiety disorders, substance abuse disorders, and or attention and deficit, hyperactivity disorder, HDHD. Also with bipolar one, the risk of suicide, which becomes a very big deal, is significantly higher among people with bipolar one disorder uh, than among the general population, as well as with bipolar two and cyclothemic. People with bipolar two disorder, frequently have other mental challenges such as anxiety disorders, substance abuse disorder, and the latter of which can exacerbate symptoms of uh, depression or hypomania. Then you get the cyclothemic, and it disrupts a person's ability to build and maintain positive relationships because they're constantly up and down and up and down, right? The irritability and emotional reactions have a negative effect in being able to develop successful relationships with family, friends, coworkers, and even romantic partners. However, unlike the wide swings people uh, seen in bipolar disorder, individuals with cyclothemia may have fewer hospitalizations, fewer days away from work, and uh, may be able to function more consistently. Treatment. Well, the reality of it is, is it is a brain disorder, right? That's the reality. A brain disorder is something that somebody cannot help or control. It just is. It's no different than you saying, you know, I am born, uh, I was born a female. That's, that's just the way it is. I was born with two arms. That's just the way it is. Which means, you know, that if, uh, if somebody is born with an, a disorder that falls into the category of bipolar disorder, you know, it is the way it is, but there's treatment for it. And that's good news, right? Typically, treatment starts with psychotherapy, which is kind of like just therapy with a psychologist, some form of a therapist. Medication is highly typically involved with it, especially when it comes to bipolar one, bipolar two. Relapse, and when we talk about relapse, relapse is when, you know, like for an alcoholic, relapse is when they drink again. For a drug addict, it's when they use again, right? For somebody who's struggling with an eating disorder, it might be somebody relapses, now they're back into eating whatever it is they want or not eating at all, whatever, you know, what that looks like. So what are we to do with that? How do we, I mean, this is a ministry that involves everybody, which is fantastic. We don't exclude, exclude anybody here, which means that we have people coming in with anxiety disorders, we have people coming in with, with uh, depression, we have people coming in with OCD, we have people coming in with all kinds of different things, right? And we wanna be able to love well and love everybody, right? We wanna love well and love everybody, but how does that happen? Well, we gotta understand how well, we gotta understand these things, right? And the first thing is, is let's not be critical and judge, right? Let's not be critical and judge. Remember, man, 
we do not repay. Sometimes it's not a matter of trying to repay more like evil with evil, right? Sometimes it's just kind of like because we don't get somebody, then we shy away from actually embracing that somebody. And the lack of our embracing somebody could actually cause them to never want to come back here again. And that's not what we want. We want people to feel like they can come back here at, on any given Tuesday night and they're going to be, li- they're going to be seen, they're going to be heard, they're going to be loved, they're going to be accepted, that this is a place for them, right? So specifically for people with bipolar, how do we, how do we love them and have them well? Well, obviously, number one first is let's pray for our own hearts. Let's pray for our own hearts, right? Make sure that, that, that we're all prayed up, you know? And, we, and then as we pray for them, let's pray for each other. That's, a, that's biblical. We are, to call, we are to pray for each other in all circumstances, right? Let's pray for each other for our health, for our healing, and for our recovery. That's what we're here for. I mean, what a concept. We're coming for, you know for health, healing, and recovery, let's pray for each other for that, right? And uh, wherever we are on the journey of this thing called healing and recovery, let's pray that we can continue progressing forward. Next thing we can do is be understanding. Remember that, that this disorder is a brain disorder and it's not their fault, right? Let's not, let's not do anything that would cause somebody to make them feel it is their fault, you know? Number three is show patience. Be understanding, like I said, and show patience. And you do this, doing this, you will be demonstrating love towards them. You know, if they got to talk, you know, if they got to talk fast, if they got to talk long, if they got to, whatever it is, what's going on, you know, just sit there and listen, right? The way you show uh, patience sometimes is just by listening. The next is accept his or her limits. There's only so much that he or she can do, Right? If you went to the gym and you expected me to lift 100 pounds, the expectation would be far too great and I would be doomed for failure. I would need you to accept the limitations that I have that um, I probably might start off with five pounds. (laughs) You know, we accept each other's limits, right? So accept their limits. Next one is actually accept your limits. You know, sometimes we can get into this mindset that we have to be the saviors and we forget that Jesus is the savior. We're the helper, but Jesus is the savior, <laughs> right? And there's only so much you can do. And, and remember, set healthy boundaries. And, and I was just talking about this with somebody earlier this evening is sometimes, you know, I put my phone on do not disturb because otherwise my phone is going off all the time. And I have to set healthy boundaries when I'm trying to do schoolwork at night or when I just need a break and I've had a 10 or a 12 hour day. And I'm like, man, or maybe I'm just sitting in a movie and I just wanna watch the movie without my phone going ding, 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 right? Set those healthy boundaries. And so you have to accept your own uh, limits. Then reduce stress. Stress is unhealthy for everyone, for you, for them, for all of us. Seek to help those around you minimize their stress and remember to seek to minimize yours. Like just minimize that, learn relaxation techniques, whatever it is, go for a walk, go to the gym, you know, uh, listen to worship music, which obviously I just recommend all the time, but do whatever it is you have to do in order for relaxation to become a part of your life. And then you are actually able to share that with others. I know that for me, I use something called a 478 breathing exercise. I have an app for it. I've shared that with some people. And I've known that those pe- some people have actually downloaded it on their phone. And it actually has it where it sets um, reminders through the day. And it'll tell me now is time. And it literally only takes two to three minutes. And I can stop what I'm doing through that day and get up from my desk and take two or three minutes and do that. And so seeking to reduce stress. And then the last one is communicate openly. This is essential in order to create a safe and trusting relationship with anyone, right? And here at Set Free, our goal is that we will communicate openly with one another so that healing and recovery will take place in the context of of each person's individual life with where you're at along the journey. You know, we're all on the same road. It's just where we at on the journey. And, And where I'm at could be a different place than where you're at, but my, go- my goodness, I could surely help you and you could help me, right? Because in the end, relationships are hard. Getting along with all of us is difficult, right? And it's, 
And doing it right and doing it in a godly way ought always be the goal that we seek to achieve with one another, whether it's in here and set free or out there in the world, right? With our family, with our friends, here at church. Man, we don't want to be one person at church and a different person, you know, at work. We want to be the same person, godly person, seeking to live in a way that honors Jesus in the way that he wants us to live. And the struggles that it is that we have, it's not that we'll be free from struggles, right? It's that our desire is that we're seeking to honor him in our life. We're bringing our struggles to him, and we can bring our struggles to each other, right? We carry our burdens with one another because that way we don't have to try to do it alone. Pride is what gets us to try to do this thing alone. Humility is what, says, what reminds us that I can't do this on my own. Never was I intended to do this on my own, and I'm going to bring my struggles to the people that I have around me in my life, like, and I know for me, and this is just, I don't know about you guys, I got four people in my life right now that I intimately share things with, four women that, that they know my struggles, they know what prayer requests I have, and, and they know that it is completely and 100% entirely confidential, what I share. And I just met with one of them this morning. I meet with her like every few weeks for, <laughs> you call it coffee, but we actually have tea, you know? But put that support in your life. Put it in your life, and I guarantee you, we will all work together collectively in a better, healthier way, in a much more godly way, and Jesus will be shining down upon us with a smile. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, Father, that you give us your word, that you remind us that revenge is not from you, Father. It is from the enemy. And we live in a fallen world, and sin, Father God, is what wreaks havoc upon our lives and upon the lives of those around us and causes others to hurt us and us to hurt others. And then the enemy, Father God, places this thought of revenge into our minds as if it is just. But you in your scripture, Father God, Jesus reminds us that it is not just and it is not our place. That actually, truly, Father God, based on scripture, vengeance is yours. And you sit in the throne of judgment. And any time that we seek to take that spot, Father God, we're actually, in essence, trying to take your spot. So may we never seek to try to take your spot, Father. And may we always seek to try to live at peace with everyone while maintaining healthy boundaries, Father God, to, to minimize the potential of getting harmed and hurt further. But may we always seek to, to do so, Father God, in, in a way that honors you. But I pray for the rest of this evening, Lord, in your name. Amen.